Well, good evening, friends, and welcome again to an exciting meeting of Revelation Today, The Great Reset. I'm your host, Wes Peppers, and we have journeyed almost three quarters of the way through the series now. We are on meeting number 16, and our topic tonight is the mark of the beast, and that goes for itself. We don't need much explaining to that, but tonight we're going to dive right into the Bible and get to the bottom of this most famous subject that so many people are familiar with and also fearful of. But we're going to leave here tonight knowing that if we put our trust and our faith and our confidence in Jesus, we have nothing to fear. Amen. Those of you in Chattanooga, we're welcoming you tonight. Those that are watching online around the world, thank you for joining us. We have folks, once again, from hundreds of locations around the globe, thousands of people watching these meetings, hundreds giving their lives to Jesus and more. We'll, we're expecting over the next several years as folks watch this program again and again that thousands will be impacted for Christ. And so thank you all for joining us. We want to encourage you to continue sharing this program with others. Click the share button, copy the website link, put it in your social media, text it to your friends, whatever way you can get the word out, please do so. So we've had folks watching from just about every continent in the world, and it is very, very exciting. I wouldn't even be surprised if we, uh, maybe some penguins in Antarctica are tuning in. What do you guys think? That's a possibility. So friends, we say this every meeting, but just as a reminder, because we have folks that tune in to the most recent meeting for the first time, we want to encourage you to look at the website there, revelationtoday.com, where there are a number of resources, including the Bible study guides that go with each night's topic, as well as free pocketbooks. We don't have a pocketbook for every subject, but for most subjects we do. You can download that and read that in your own personal study time. Also, just as a reminder, we have the donate button. You can click there if you'd like to give a gift. It is written. It sure helps us to be able to take these types of programs to more people around the world. And that is our goal and that is our mission. Also on the website, there is the store where you can find additional resources for yourself or to share with friends. We encourage you to check out the different items that are there. There's also a pre-order form for the DVD sets. So if you'd like to get a set for yourself or for a friend, you can do that right on the website. As well, and as always, submit your Bible questions to us. We love getting those. We love answering those and, and giving people the answers that they're looking for from the Bible. So please do submit those. We'll either answer them in a program here or back to you through an email, so please do send those in. Well, we have some exciting subjects coming up, and our very next subject is going to be on Revelation 17, that system of Babylon, that harlot that we find the Bible describes in Revelation chapter 17. Also, our next topic following that, finding light through the darkness. That will be one of the most important topics, and you will not want to miss that. A lot of people have been asking us, what's going to happen after the series? Well, for those of you watching online, we have a solution for you. It is written.tv is a wonderful resource where you can find programming on just about any type of subject you want. There's some on health. There's additional things on Bible, on Bible prophecy. There's Bible questions that are answered on our line upon line program. There's just a whole host of things. So please do check out it is written. Dot TV. Well, at this time, we're going to answer some Bible questions, so I'm going to invite Pastor John to join me here on the platform. If you would, just join me in welcoming him, welcoming him tonight. Amen. There he is. Welcome, Pastor John. Great to see you. Better to see you. Good evening, everyone. All right. That'll, that'll work. They're, they're, they're warming up. They're getting yeah. there. I've been trying to train them, but, you know, we're working on them. Appreciate that. Yeah. Right. Amen. Yeah. Okay. We'll let it go. All right. Yeah. Our first question may wake him up a little bit. Amen. Let's do does, that. Does the Bible forbid cremation? Oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you. No, of course not. Of course not. Now, here's where the question comes from, because the Bible talks about a resurrection that's going to take place in the last day. And what people will say is, well, how in the world can there be a resurrection if the body is burned up and you just got a bunch of ashes in an urn? What you need to know is that God is not dependent on whatever is left of a body in the grave in order to construct a new body. You can imagine Jesus at the resurrection scratching around in the dirt. There must be more of this woman here somewhere. 
what can I find? No, the Bible says we're given a new body. Thank the Lord. You know what? The old one, by the time we're done on this earth, the old thing is worn out practically. We had aches and pains and complaints about all kinds of things, and we hurt in places we didn't know would hurt when we were younger. And what God does is gives us a new body. Now, if cremation was wrong, then folks who hate to say it, perish in fires and, and die at sea and consumed by sharks and so forth. No, no. When Jesus returns, the dead in Christ rise, we are given a new body. Paul wrote about that. You know that passage where he said, my preference is to be absent from the body and to be with the Lord. That, that passage, one of the most misquoted verses in all of misquoted verses. There he's talking about the new body that we get when uh, Jesus comes back. So good news. Cremation is okay. Uh, my advice to you on this subject is be really nice to your kids because ultimately they're going to decide. Leave very clear instructions. And uh, if you don't, anything could happen. It's not going to matter a whole lot because when it happens to you or me, we'll be dead. We'll be asleep blissfully unaware of anything taking place on this side of the surface of the earth. You know, God said, from dust you came, dust you shall return. So it yep. just speeds it up a little That's bit. That's all it does. It That's hastens it the process. All right, number two, I have always heard that the Antichrist will come in the future, at the end of time, following the rapture. If what you have said is true, how can so many people miss that this power has been active throughout history and still today? Ladies and gentlemen, so many people did not miss when the Reformation began in the year 1517, it was very clear as to who the Antichrist was. It wasn't hard to figure out. It measured up the Bible. Martin Luther was clear, and not just Luther, but Wesley and Wycliffe and Huss and Jerome and Zwingli and Knox and the whole Reformation body was very clear as to the entity or the identity of the little horn in Daniel 7 and the nation in Revelation chapter 13, same one. They all pointed to Rome and said, it's the church of Rome. By the way, by the way, I don't want to promote bigotry. We are against that. But you might recall, even if you weren't alive at the time, you shall, should remember, when John F. Kennedy was running for president of these United States, it was said, oh my, we can't have him as president because he's a Catholic. Now, that's a bad attitude. We have a system in the United States where religion is not a test of uh, holding public office, and it shouldn't be. My, my point is not that he shouldn't have been president. My point is that sentiment has shifted. We're going back only 50 years to a time when the nation was horrified at the thought of electing a Roman Catholic president, indicating that the, that, that, that the, the view of the system of Catholicism was a certain way once. Now, I don't buy too much of the cry, uh, belly aching about anti-Catholicism. I don't think this nation indulges in that at all. Uh, uh, maybe once upon a time, but the reasons were theological and political. So there's been a big shift. Now, miraculously, down here in the end of time, Protestants are saying the Antichrist will be one person who will arise at the end of time, and he will do this and that. Not true. It's a system very clearly pointed out in the Bible and has been around for many, many hundreds of years. Here's how the change in view came. The Church of Rome realized it was in trouble because people like Martin Luther and others were using Scripture to identify Rome as the Antichrist. They were clear. Look at this. It's them. And Rome, of course, was in a tight spot. So Rome commissioned a couple of Jesuits. One's, one was named Alcazar. Another was named Ribera. Alcazar looked at the prophecies and he said, I got it. Let's put them in the past. He recast those prophecies, applying them to days gone by. Out of that was born the system of prophetic interpretation known as preterism. It's about as solid as quicksand. There's nothing much good about it at all. But you sell it, someone's going to buy it. Ribera said, I know the approach I will take. I'll take these prophecies concerning Revelation 13, Daniel 7, and put them way in the end of time. I will, I will apply them to an individual that comes in the end of time. Now, no one really bought it initially, but a fellow named Edward Irving got a hold of these. The, the Plymouth Brethren started teaching this. And then what do you know? Protestants in this country, uh, respected seminaries in this country, started teaching as Protestantism an invention of the Roman Catholic Church. 
an invention invented just so Rome could deflect the heat that was coming upon it based on what Protestants were saying the scriptures meant concerning Rome. Hope you're following me here. How do we get to the place where Protestants are saying it's one man in the end of time? The Roman Catholics commissioned a Jesuit to, who, who, who taught that in the beginning. And over time, it caught on. It caught on. It's remarkable that it did. There's no biblical basis for it, not a shred of biblical evidence, but it caught on. So we understand that the Bible is very clear. <clears throat> it refers to a system, not the people, but a system. This teaches all sorts of very, very unbiblical practices, damages the high priestly ministry of Jesus, claims to be able to dispense grace, says that salvation is found alone in its fellowship, says that you receive salvation by receiving the sacraments that it dispenses, and we're just scratching the surface. No, the Vatican City, that's the Antichrist of Bible prophecy, very clear. And all the other inventions down through time have been concocted really by the devil so that you're not looking where you ought to be looking and you're missing what really nobody should miss. You answered uh, number three. It was, the question was about is the Antichrist a man or a system? But you kind of, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little more no, on that. No, system, really, really clear. It's a system. The prophecies make that clear. We'll quickly run over that tonight in tonight's presentation. It's led by a man, but it is a system. Yeah, led by a man, for Number sure. Number four, is it biblical to return tithe, or is that an old covenant practice done away with? Fascinating question. No, tithe is, is mentioned in the New Testament. Jesus spoke to certain individuals who tithed, and he said, these you ought to have done. There's no question about it. The book of Hebrews endorses the tithing system. I want to read something to you from the book of Malachi, chapter 3. What I know is that if I set myself up as an investment advisor and told you that any money that you invested through me would multiply wonderfully and you'd be financially set, if you could bring yourself to trust me, then I would do very, very well as an investment advisor. I want to tell you, there's a far better investment advisor than anyone you know. That's God. And we read in Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, it says, Will a man rob God? That's pretty serious. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? The answer comes back in tithes and offerings. And I would like to point out a word in that little phrase, the word and, in tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. God says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. He's referencing the church there. That there may be food in my house, and try me now on this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Imagine your broker or your investment advisor or someone at work telling you they'd do that for you. You'd never believe him. But God says he'll do that. Goes further. He says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. God says, put me to the test. Try me now in this. Frankly, even if God did not open the windows of heaven and pour you out an immense blessing, tithing would still be the right thing to do. It's for the support of the ministry. That was the whole idea. You don't give tithe to support the Crippled Children's Society and St. Jude's Hospital for Children and so forth. That would be offering. Uh, but tithe is returned to God through the church for the support of the ministry. So then the gospel ministry can go ahead. It's a very smart system. God said 10%. That's what the word tithe means. It means a tenth. So everybody bears the same burden. You could give more if you wish. That would be okay. But I don't know how I would go in life not tithing. What I would be saying to God is, I've got this. I don't want or need your blessing on my finances. I can take care of all of that. That'd be a dangerous thing to say to God. God may simply take you at your word and give you the desire of your heart. The other thing is, I, I just don't know that I could live knowing that I'm a thief stealing from God. Also, not doing my part to support the work of ministry. So tithing is something... For me in my house, we, we just have to do. Not because God said, I don't mean that, but this is a biblical principle. We don't want to be without. 
Now, for the person who says, I don't know how I can make it without 10% of my income, I would say, God has promised to bless the remaining 90%. God's blessing on 90% will make that 90% go way further than you could make 100% go without God's blessing. If you've not tithed, I encourage you to do so. I, I Don't even wait. Begin tithing. It's very biblical. It's very much for today. You cannot outgive God. You, you just cannot. God has done so much. He gave you Jesus. Jesus. Salvation. Everlasting life. If you tithed everything you had, which I guess wouldn't be a tithe, it would still seem like so little in comparison to the blessing of God in your life. And by the way, just in case you wonder, I can't speak for every church, but I can speak for ministers of this church, of which I am one. Uh, pastors don't get paid a king's ransom, and, and I don't mind saying this. The, the, the gospel ministers who fly in corporate jet or private jets and live a lavish lifestyle, shame on them. Just shame on them. I don't mean that a person can't be rich. Being rich is just fine. I don't even mind if, if gospel ministers are rich, but I'm not talking about rich. I mean stinking rich. And it's, I guess it's okay if you write a number of best-selling books and you earn a ton of money. Okay, it's up to you as to what you're going to do with it. That's, that's, that's up to you. But it just doesn't seem right that somebody would say, I'm here serving Jesus, but pardon me while I step over top of you to get into my private jet. That just doesn't smell right. And it doesn't seem like it's what Jesus would do either. That abundance perhaps could be used in better and more productive ways. What I can tell you about ministers in the Seventh-day Adventist church is that they're paid fairly, although many of them might suggest a little more might be even a little more fair. They're not going to starve now or any time in the future, but it's by no means extravagant. And it's equitable. So you don't have the pastor of the little church wanting to be the pastor of the big church so he gets paid a whole a lot more money. That's just a bad system. It's not like that in the church that I'm a part of. So please don't worry if you tithe here that somehow what that means is some fat cat minister is going to get himself big and rich. It doesn't work that way. We don't want it to work that way. So you tithe to God, then you know you are supporting gospel ministry. The blessing of God is upon you and what you have, and you can expect God to bless you wonderfully. Amen. I think you'll answer the last question in the, in the topic tonight. How can the majority of people be mistaken about the Sabbath? It doesn't seem possible that so many religious leaders could be wrong, although it does seem clear to me that the Sabbath is biblical. The religious leaders in Jesus' day were really wrong. And in their midst, they had someone who raised the dead, gave sight to the blind, enabled the lame to walk. Uh, Peter, wasn't it, pulled the fish out of the ocean. Jesus said, check in its mouth. There was a gold coin. He turned water into wine and a little boy's lunch into a feed for thousands of people. The religious leaders were able to look at him and, and be wrong, dead wrong. Now, don't, I don't mean to suggest you shouldn't trust religious leaders. We want to be able to do that, but don't expect the majority to be right. What's right is the Bible. That's what's right. I'm not going to tell you I'm right. I'll tell you the Bible is right. Let's see if we can figure out what the Bible is saying. When it comes to the subject of the Sabbath, it's not too terribly hard. If you were to give somebody who had never heard of God a Bible and say, please start in the beginning and keep reading until you find the holy day of God. So 1,189 chapters in the Bible. You might think they'd have to read for a month of Sundays. They'd have to read for about three and a half minutes, and then they'd say, I found it, it's right here. It's very, very, very clear. How can people be wrong? Another thing that I must say is, what about that? Just leave that to one side, and let's ask about you. What are you doing with the light that you have? Some people are wrong, but they're very sincerely wrong. I can't explain that. Sometimes you, you may look at something and just not see it. That's okay. I don't want to castigate or criticize or denigrate somebody who doesn't see it the way I think the Bible sees it. There are many, many sincere people who don't understand the Sabbath or what happens when a person dies. They're wrong about hellfire. They're eating pork and catfish. Doesn't mean they're not sincere. Doesn't mean they don't love God. Does not mean God does not love them. Does not mean God isn't using them. 
God's growing people. He doesn't grow everybody at the same time. So as he's calling you, surrender to the calling of God. And if you're concerned about some minister on television or somebody who writes books, pray for that person. They're not your guide and we are not their judge. Two very important points, I think. Well said. Thank you, Pastor John. We appreciate that. When our answer is from the Bible, amen? Amen. At this time, Marion Peppers is going to come and share a beautiful music with us entitled There is a Fountain. And as she does that, our ushers are going to come and collect the Saturday night offering that we often do each week. And for those of you who are watching online, we invite you to click that donate button and and, and do your donation online as well. And all of this is able to further the ministry, the impact that it is written can do with its programming around the world. Thank you so much.
Great to see you here tonight. Let's pray and expect that God will speak to our hearts. Father in heaven, this time is yours. Speak to us, we ask you. I would pray very sincerely that you would not let the limitations of a faulty human being get in the way of your spirit speaking. At the same time, don't let our faulty ears prevent us from hearing just what you want us to hear. We are calling on you, the God of heaven. Speak to us, we ask you. Guide us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know for sure, but my expectation is that you remember where you were at that time just as vividly as I remember where I was. My wife, Melissa, and I and our little baby boy were in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As a matter of fact, we were staying somewhere west of Tulsa, not too terribly far. It was the morning. I was online. That was back in the dark ages, you know. Dial-up internet access pages took forever to download. But this morning, that morning, the pages were populating very, very slowly. I thought, oh, what is wrong? What is wrong with this? computer. We were staying in a home that was not our own. We were there temporarily. Maybe there's something wrong with the phone lines here at this house. But in the fullness of time, I saw something on my computer screen that just shocked me. And I called out to Melissa, quick, come, you won't believe this. You won't believe this. The United States is under attack, evidently. There was a report of an attack where a plane flew into the World Trade Center. And then, then I read, I don't know exactly how this was, but the page was loading very slowly. Then I read second tower had been hit, and somewhere around there I read that the White House had been hit or was going to be hit. Of course, that was an erroneous report. We thank God it was. What a disaster. We had no TV where we were staying. That wasn't a disaster. That was a good thing, but this was a disaster. We jumped into the vehicle we had and drove as quickly as we can, not knowing exactly where we were going, but we figured Walmart. We went to Walmart and joined a small crowd of people over on the back side of Walmart, silently gathering around a television set, looking, some with their mouth wide open, everybody wondering what this could possibly mean. It might have been that night speaking from the Oval Office. It might have been the next day, but I think it was that night. President... George W. Bush said, today our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist attacks. Freedom under attack. Freedom under attack. Speaking during the Civil War, at the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, this was November of 1863, President Abraham Lincoln very famously said these words, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. It was a very short speech, seven sentences. It concluded with these words. This nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. There's something about freedom. Our hearts beat in harmony with freedom. When you consider the countries of Eastern Europe that labored and toiled under communism for many decades, you understand that the citizenry wanted freedom. People leaving communist countries and risking their lives, many times losing their lives in a desperate bid for freedom as they tried to cross borders from their closed up countries to countries that were somewhat more open. Our hearts beat in harmony with the thought of freedom. You know, by the time Lincoln appeared on the scene, the United States had grown substantially since its very humble beginnings. 
The population of the country when Abraham Lincoln was the president of these United States was more or less 30 million. A long way from 1620 when a hundred or so people on board the Mayflower landed on these shores. From a hundred to 30 million. That was some growth, but it was still a new country, still a relatively small population considering we have more than one state with 30 million residents right now. And maybe it's one. We've come a long way. They were looking, the pilgrims, to create a society uh, that in some way harmonized with their religious ideals. Some of those people on the Mayflower were destined for the colony of Virginia. Four of them were children who were indentured servants. Times have changed. It was a rough start for the colonies. But within 150 years of the pilgrims arriving here, the Constitution was drafted, written by Thomas Jefferson. And the Constitution started with words such as these. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and then follows some of the most famous and stirring and in fact meaningful words in all of literature, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The United States declared itself or themselves to be free. You might expect that something as vital as freedom would come under attack down here in Earth's last days. Because there is, as you know, somebody who hates freedom. We all of us are caught in a battle. It's a very serious battle. Around us, what do we see? We see war and racism and terrorism and violence. And we see illness. And, and we want to say, oh, things are just rough down here. We want to say, oh, people are lousy. Accidents happen. Folks get sick. This is, this is our, our reaction when we see things taking place around us. And that'd be all right, but as we've already discussed in these presentations, when you look at what's going on around you, you have to ask yourself a fundamental question, and that is, why are these things so? The earth began in perfection. These United States were built on certain solid ideals, but man, we've got a long way from those ideals. And we ask ourselves how we happen to be caught in this chain of events. You might remember a few presentations back, we talked about a Bible story that helps us to see things as they really are. It's the story of Job. Satan afflicted Job, and God allowed him to do so. He prevented Satan from taking Job's life. Was it cruel of God? Oh, certainly not. Job came through it okay, and his experience was blessed as a result. As a matter of fact, you will find Job in the book of Job complaining about what was taking place, and I'm not knocking him for that. He struggled to understand. You know, his question was, why me? Why this? What have I done wrong? You get to the end of the book of Job, shortly before the end of the book of Job, and Job says these words. He says, I had heard of you with the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. He said, I get it now. You're God. Remember all of the complaining and God said things like, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I did thus and so? And Job understood his role was to trust God. He knew that there was a God. His job was to trust God. He may not always understand all the ins and outs of life on this planet. He may not always understand God's ways, the way God chooses to play out justice or mercy. But his role was to trust God no matter what he could make of what he saw. And we understand from looking at the book of Job that there is a great spiritual battle raging behind the scenes. And what we see, a little bit like the warning light that appears occasionally on the dashboard of your automobile. There's a light that comes on. Check engine. Okay, I've got a problem. At least it appears that way. I don't know what it is, but it's beneath the hood. It's under the bonnet as we would say where I'm from and in other civilized countries. The light demonstrates that there's a problem. 
You might not know exactly what the problem is, and that's what warfare and violence and racism and hatred and injustice and illness and terrorism do. They help us to see that there's something going on beneath the surface, behind the scenes. A fallen angel is responsible for the misery and the sin that we see and experience in the world today. You can expect freedom to be attacked. And in this country, and many countries like the United States of America, we experience freedom of religion. That's really important. We experience freedom of assembly or to assemble, freedom of expression, free speech. You can expect that freedoms would come under attack because what Satan hates is freedom. God gave him free choice and he squandered it. God gave Adam and Eve freedom to choose. They blew it too, but God never did remove their agency, their freedom to choose. God gives us freedom, and what Satan is afraid of is that we will use that wisely. We might invest that freedom in growing our faith in God and in serving God out of freedom according to the dictates of our conscience, guided by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. But ultimately... This house is going to be divided, and it will be divided over a single and, in fact, a, a signal issue. I want to suggest that we remember a verse we looked at last time, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, which says, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an, tell me, angel of light. Expect the unexpected. You should because a good deception typically closely mirrors the genuine article. That's why in the United States, you don't see counterfeit $3 bills. That's why in Canada, you don't see counterfeit $4 coins. Those would be bad counterfeits. They don't mirror the genuine article in any way at all. Since its establishment, these United States have been very open about their or its or our Judeo-Christian values. Even the currency is so open as to say, in God we trust. If you were the devil, and I'm only saying that hypothetically, of course, but if you were the devil, you'd be wanting to deprive people of freedom. This nation has been a bright and shining light for freedom. So would you go after that nation that stands as a beacon of hope for all the world? Uh, you've heard this said perhaps even in a political sense, but I just mean it in a straight up sense, not political at all, for all of its faults. More people want to come to this land, to these United States, than any other country on the planet. Look around you here. There are people who have come to this land from all around the globe. Wherever you might be, you know that immigration is still a very big and important deal in this country. You can criticize this land if you want, but the devil sees what it is. It is a bastion, a beacon for hope. Here, the gospel is proclaimed and believed. You can believe anything you want, and it's pretty obvious because many people do. They believe just anything they want. This is still a great nation, absolutely is. And you would be naive if you did not think, if you did not expect this nation to be the object of Satan's very determined, very pointed attack. Look in Revelation chapter 13. Here's a little review. There'll be plenty of review in this presentation. We start in verse 1. I stood on the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea. That's a nation coming up from among the peoples, having seven heads and ten horns. On his horns, ten crowns. On his heads, a blasphemous name. The beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. John goes on to say, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. But then his deadly wound was healed. And then all the world marveled and followed the beast. Verse 4 says, They worshipped the dragon who gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, 
Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with them? Now, I want to just stop here and look at that verse. Verse 4 of Revelation 13. Speaking of the people of the world, so they worshipped the dragon. The dragon in the book of Revelation, that would represent who? Satan. So you just read a mind-blowing phrase. Speaking of the people of the world, John in Revelation, under the aegis of the Holy Spirit, wrote, so they worshipped the devil. Imagine that. So the people of the world yielded their allegiance to Satan himself. Now you could say, are we talking about the the Wiccan individuals? Are we talking about the devil worshippers? They're certainly growing in number. Well, sure we are, but you know that that's not the burden of this passage. Does John suggest that one day churches are going to take down the sign that says Baptist, Pentecostal, Nazarene, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Adventist, and put up the sign Satanist? No, he's not suggesting that at all. So you must know that, that, that John is not talking about everybody tattooed with a pentagram, chanting incantations. You understand that something is going to come into the, into the world that will cause people, I believe unwittingly for the most part, to surrender their allegiance not to God but to the enemy of souls. Remember, the devil transforms himself into an angel of light to the extent that we read in Revelation 13 and verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. All? Well, yes, except for those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we've got something coming to the world that's that's fascinating. Who is this power that is going to be, well, empowered by Satan and used to deceive the world. Well, we looked at it already. We looked at a, a longish list of identification points. And we discovered that the little horn of Daniel 7, the nation in Revelation chapter 13, can only be the Vatican City. We're not casting aspersions upon individual adherents of that denomination, of that church. We're not. You would understand that there are good, heaven-bound people in, I would imagine, every Christian denomination or group across the fruited plain. There may be some exceptions, but I'd want to be careful about that. You would imagine that there are people going to heaven who right now are in whatever church you can imagine because they love God, they're living up to the light that they have. As far as they know, they're following the Bible. They've yielded their hearts to Jesus. They're doing his will. Down at the end of time, however, we've come to a different time, or we will come to a different time. You know today, you can have somebody in church A blissfully unaware of some of the key issues of Scripture. But God looks at that person, says, I see the heart, I see the mind, I see the overall tenor of the life. There are some things that they don't know, but you know you've read in the book of Acts where the Bible says, the times of this ignorance God winked at. So God winks at or turns a blind eye at a lot of ignorance. He's never minded ignorance because human beings tend to be ignorant. But that same verse goes on to say, but now God commands all people everywhere to repent. So while now you're going to find people unaware of the issues, perhaps their theological understanding is stunted on some level, maybe they haven't read or studied or been made aware of certain things in the Bible, In earth's last days, the key issues are going to be clear. That's why we read in Revelation chapter 14, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made, worship him as the creator. Second angel, Babylon has fallen. The third angel, don't follow the beast or receive the mark of the beast. This is the eternal gospel. The everlasting gospel goes to the whole world. The world hears this. There's coming a time when everybody will know. So why does the Bible say that the world will worship this power? We've identified it as the Vatican City. No, the world isn't going to convert wholesale to one particular faith. Don't think that. Nor do we need to believe that the entire world is suddenly going to get religion. 
This is not going to happen. We don't need to believe that people who today live in open opposition to some of the principles of the Bible are going to repent and run to Jesus and pour out their hearts to him. That's not what the Bible is getting at. The Bible is telling us clearly that something will happen that will enable people or give people the opportunity to yield their allegiance to the Vatican, the first nation mentioned in Revelation and chapter 13. And according to what we've studied already, that second nation in Revelation 13 will use its power to, to, and its influence to cause the world to follow after that first nation. Second nation uses its power to cause the world to follow the first nation. Leads to very, very big issues in earth's last days. Revelation 13, starting in verse 16, he causes all, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, King James says, in, and that no one might buy and sell except for the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So what's the mark of the beast? We're going to look at that. What becomes the key, the defining issue down in the close of time? What's the sign of the authority of the church of Rome. We've looked at this already, a couple of these quotes, in a, in a church catechism, much like something I briefly studied out of when I was a little boy. Which is the Sabbath day? The answer comes, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Now the question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? And the answer is, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, pause a moment with me. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. That's really clear. In it you'll not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your cattle, or even the stranger who comes within your gates. And why? Because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all that in them is rested the seventh day. He made you and he rested. He wants you to rest to remember that you've been made by God, that God is your God, that you are the works of his hands. And by the way, Sabbath rest is just plain good for you. We work on a circadian rhythm. That's a 24-hour rhythm. But also science will tell you on a circuseptin rhythm, a seven-day rhythm just flows through our being, physically hardwired in. God made you to live in harmony with the seven-day uh, week. Uh, what did Jesus say? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's the human family. It's as though God said, in fact, it is that God said, I've made something for you. Adam and Eve created on the sixth day. The first full day of their existence was a Sabbath. God said, this is for you. This is great. And I would understand if you said, I don't get it, a day. When I was a kid, I struggled to stay in church for an hour. In fact, we would bolt right after communion. We'd get out at about the three-quarter mark if we were lucky. Leave. So why a day? Oh, imagine a day. Imagine if, imagine if the world recognized that God was the creator backed off for a day. It would be good for family. It would be good for your health. It would be good for the environment. It would be good no matter how you cut it. Imagine that. Anybody can see that. It's go, 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 get, 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 work, work, work. God says, oh, no, no, no. That was never God's plan. And by the way, I don't want you to think that God is against working and getting ahead. If you work hard and you get ahead, God bless you. That may well be the blessing of God. I say may well be because it may not be. Kind of depends on how you relate to that and what you do with your blessings as to who's really behind that. So God says, remember the Sabbath day. It's a sign of his creative power. It's a gift given us by heaven. But the church... Well, the church doesn't see it that way. Cardinal James Gibbon wrote, reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these two alternatives, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. I want you to see what the cardinal wrote. 
Compromise is what? Now, this is a leader in the Roman Catholic Church. Reason and sense demand that you choose one or another, one or the other. You choose to be a Protestant, and if you do, you would acknowledge the seventh-day Sabbath, or you're a Catholic, and if you do, you acknowledge Sunday. Let me put that to you in another way. The cardinal said, if you observe Sunday, then you are paying homage to the Roman Catholic Church. If you don't want to do that, that would make you a Protestant, and therefore you would keep the seventh-day Sabbath. It's pretty clear the church changed the Ten Commandments. Now, if you don't have any problem with the church changing the Ten Commandments, then I guess you're okay. You're fine with this. Don't worry too much, except, of course, God would have you rethink. But if you believe it's perfectly acceptable for human beings to alter and amend the Ten Commandments of Almighty God, then you don't have a problem with this. This was an intentional change. And I want to say, too, that the church which changed the fourth commandment didn't stop there. If you look at the Ten Commandments in the Roman Catholic Church teachings, you will see that the commandment forbidding the worship of idols is not there. Or in some iterations of the Ten Commandments, it's merged with the first commandment. Have no other gods before me, don't worship idols. Many iterations, it's just removed for obvious reasons. The Roman Catholic Church was and is filled with idols and images. And by the way, those who say, oh, we don't pray to them, we just pray and they remind us of the Virgin Mary or Saint Joseph or Jesus or whoever it might be, that doesn't cut it either. That's not biblical. Idols have no place in church and no place in worship. How do we know that? Because God said. So the church removed that commandment or melded it into the first commandment. Well, that would leave nine commandments. And nobody's going to buy the nine commandments. And so they took the tenth commandment, the one that deals with coveting, and cut it in two. So the ninth commandment says, thou shalt not covet this. The tenth commandment says, thou shalt not covet that. Ladies and gentlemen, how in the world does that church get a free pass from Christianity? They changed the law of God. Don't deny that they changed the law of God. This ought to be a massive alarm bell ringing for you. Except, of course, Protestantism helps out by saying, oh, you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. There has been nothing more crazy said in a church than that. Now, if what you're saying is obedience doesn't buy salvation, or you have no argument, I don't even know a single person who believes that it does. But the converted heart will love to, will want to obey God. And in spite of that converted heart's faultiness, that individual will grow in the grace of God to obey God more and more and more so that more and more of God's will is done in that heart. But here you've got a church that changed God's law, changed the fourth, removed the second, and cut the tenth commandment in half which I think is quite stunning. But let's go back to a few more quotations regarding the fourth commandment. In the year 2005, Pope Benedict XVI said this, and thus they also understood that Saturday was no longer the liturgical day, but Sunday, on which the Lord wants to be with us physically again and again and wants to nourish us with his body so that we ourselves may become his body in this world. Now, those words, of course, they sound well and good. I expect they're well-intentioned, but I want you to notice where the Church of Rome took the credit. Saturday, no longer the liturgical day, the Sabbath day, but Sunday, appealing to this idea of the Eucharist, a sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church, that you are to receive according to Rome, and as you receive, you receive special grace given you by God. Of course, not actually accurate. But here the church, just a few years ago, said the day was changed. We have no problem with that. 
The same Pope wrote these words. He wrote, the Second Vatican Council teaches that the church celebrates the Paschal mystery every seventh day, which day is appropriately called the Lord's Day or Sunday. Sunday remains the fertile foundation and at the same time the fundamental nucleus of the liturgical year, which originated in Christ's resurrection thanks to which the features of eternity were impressed on time. Notice this. The word, Origen affirms, has moved the feast of the Sabbath to the day on which the light was produced and has given us as an image of true repose Sunday, the day of salvation, the first day of the light in which the Savior of the world, after completing all his work with men and after conquering death, crossed the threshold of heaven, surpassing the creation of the six days and receiving the blessed Sabbath and rest in God. Now, the words were written by an absolute master. This wasn't written by a couple of bumbling guys at their local bar. These are well-educated, extremely erudite, very intelligent individuals. And if you weren't to know better, you would say, well, that's that then. It was changed by the Word, who would be Jesus himself. But that's a breathtaking statement. We just changed it. They appeal to the resurrection, as though because of the resurrection, the Sabbath day should be changed. Quick question for you. I'll tell you the answer in advance. The answer is yes. What did I say the answer is? Okay. Is the resurrection important, yes or no? Well done. Very important. But does the commandment of God change because of the resurrection? No, a thousand times no. How can that even be? But the church says, oh, it changed because of the resurrection. Now, I want you to notice that Joseph Ratzinger, the, the gentleman who later became Pope Benedict XVI, appealed to Origen as authorizing the Sabbath being changed to Sunday. Origin, not John, not Daniel, not Paul, not Moses, and definitely not Jesus. Origin, one of the church fathers, some call him. He was a scholar who lived in the second and third century. Hardly John the Revelator. And frankly, if you look into his life, there are some people who think Origin was a little bit weird, but we'll leave his personal stuff out of this for now just a man and the pope of rome appealed to just a man to validate the changing of the sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week it just cannot be so benedict went on to write he wrote about this frequently inspired by knowledge of this saint ignatius of antioch asserted again not jesus we are no longer keeping the sabbath but the lord's day Sunday is the day on which the risen Lord makes himself present among his followers, invites them to his banquet and shares himself with them so that they too, united and configured to him, may worship God properly. St. Ignatius of Antioch. Every Sunday, Pope Benedict wrote, and every Eucharist is a personal encounter with Christ. He wrote much more about this. Now, I imagine you could have an encounter with Christ on Sunday. But if you were looking to encounter Christ, you would want to do that out of a heart of obedience. You would certainly want to be observing the day given by God, written with his finger on tables of stone. I'm not asking you to decide whether you want to believe me or a pope. I'm not asking you judge between me and Origen or me and St. Ignatius of Antioch. I am asking you to consider what the Bible says And then ask yourself, is this God's will for us today? Surely the answer is yes. And now we can understand how Revelation 13 verse 8 can be fulfilled. What did it say? All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. The mark of the beast is very simple. When you accept a change in God's holy moral law and you follow the beast, 
And follow what that nation in Revelation chapter 13 says, rejecting what God says, you have rejected the sovereignty of God. That's what the mark of the beast is, relegating the sovereignty of God beneath, below the authority of a human being. The true Sabbath day, that's humanity coming into communion with God. That's what the Sabbath represents. And in fact, that's the seal of God. The seventh-day Sabbath is the seal of the living God. It is the seal of the law of God. The mark of the beast is a counterfeit. That's people choosing their own way ahead of, above the commandments of Almighty God. A person has the opportunity to look God in the face and say, yes, I'll do your will. At the same time, you might choose to look in God's face and say, no. Let me see if it's still there. Let me see. Just a second. Yes, it is. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I, I, I'm not telling you this to try to prove to you that I'm right. I, I don't need your affirmation on that point. I'm not telling you this just because a certain church says that this is so. I couldn't care less ultimately about what any church says unless that church is in harmony with God. What I'm sharing with you is what the Bible says. It's just about as plain as anything can be. Although the question is frequently asked, how can Sunday be wrong when everybody's doing it? As I've mentioned already, a decent counterfeit always runs very closely to the truth. Just because the majority does something, it doesn't make it right might seem like a small thing to you, not small to God. God's thundered it from Sinai, wrote it on stone, reinforced it again and again and again. Jesus came here, and in demonstrating to us how to live, he lived a life of obedience and remembered the Sabbath day and kept it holy. When God has your heart, you will want to do his will out of love for him. You won't look around and say, well, let me see what others are doing. You won't put your finger to the wind and say, let me see which way the winds are blowing. You will say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, Jesus said, you will do what? And I don't believe that Jesus is saying, really? You say you love me? Come on, prove it. I don't believe Jesus was saying that. I believe Jesus was saying, if you love me, something's going to happen in your life. If you love me, you're going to keep the commandments, just like night follows day, just like the, the rain comes and, and, and the seasons change. It's going to happen in your life as an inevitability. Now, I want to answer this question here because somebody is thinking, well, what can be so wrong with this because we do it to worship God? Yes, good question. Wrong question, but still a good question. You never want to say, what can be wrong with? Because then you're trying to justify a certain course of action. And you don't want to do that. You want to say, what's the will of God here? But I understand you're talking about your Aunt Gladys, who all of her life, she's gone to church on Sunday, and she's been a faithful old soul, and she loves God. Well, let God judge Aunt Gladys. We are not judging her or anybody else. We are simply looking to the Bible. And we see that a human institution changed or thought to change, according to Daniel 7.25, a divine institution. But what about that idea? What can be so wrong with it? We are worshiping God. We're doing this out of love for God. Certainly not going to question anybody's sincerity or sit in judgment on anyone. But I want to read to you from a certain Bible story found in 1 Samuel. And I think I have the page right about here. The prophet was Samuel. The king, he had not been king for very long, was Saul. Impressive fellow, impressive physically. He was a big, tall fellow, stood head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He was a goodly man, evidently a good man as far as good men can go. But what Saul started to do was he, he started to play fast and loose with the will of God. Here's what we see. The prophet said, now go and attack Amalek. 
and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. Kill them both, man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Oh, that seems severe, isn't it? It is. But God knew the world was better off without a single trace of these individuals. Get rid of them. They are a curse to themselves and a blot on the landscape, and they are a threat to the viability of the nation of Israel. Get rid of them, King Saul, every last one. So Saul gathered the people together, numbered them in Telaim. Could have brought my glasses out, I suppose. And it tells us how many there were. It was a big army. He had quite the army. Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Verse 8. He took also Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Did he obey God, yes or no? No. But you watch this. He's going to justify this. Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to destroy them. But everything that they despised and was worthless, that they destroyed. Now, God told Samuel, oh, man, am I sorry that Saul is king. He has disobeyed me. So when Samuel came to meet Saul, Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. This is the king speaking. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Had he? Yes or no? No, he hadn't. He absolutely hadn't. But he convinced himself that he had. That's interesting, isn't it? You'll find believers in Jesus today who can convince themselves they've done the will of God when the Bible plainly says that they have not. Plainly. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to a time of great crisis down here in the end of time. So Samuel said, what then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul pivoted pretty quickly and he said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. What for? to sacrifice them to the Lord. They have spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And so Samuel said to Saul, Oh, really? You have spared them to offer to God in sacrifice? Well, that sounds like worship to me. That would be okay then. Saul said, we, we, we mostly obeyed for the most part. I mean, pretty well, probably 99%. or well, let's say 90%. But this 10%, we haven't. But we're justifying that by telling you that this is for worship. As though that makes it okay. Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, weren't you the head of the tribes of Israel? Didn't the Lord anoint you king over Israel? The Lord sent you saying, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them till they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? My brother, my sister, God will ask the same question of multitudes of people in the end of time. Why didn't you just obey God? This isn't God being legalistic. This is God being God. He asks for obedience. Love is obedience in action. It's what it is. And God will say to people in the end of time, you knew. Why then? Why in the world then did you not simply choose to obey? Well, we did this to worship. We went to church every Sunday. We prayed and sang. We sang good songs, hymns even. We gave offerings. We said amen loudly. Some of us, we stood and clapped and hollered and held our hands up. We were so into this. This was real worship. And God is saying, there's something about this that you don't understand. Worship would be obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken better than the fat of rams, God said. So we don't get to say to God, oh, we made it okay because 
Origen said so. Because St. Ignatius of Antioch said so. Because the church said so. Because the magisterium said so. Because a priest said so. We don't make it okay by saying the Pope said, or my pastor said, or our preacher said, or the gospel minister said. Ladies and gentlemen, life is found in Christ and in surrendering to Jesus. He who has the Son has life, John wrote in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12. And having the Son would be Jesus guiding you in his footsteps, not rebellion against God. To know God's will and to say no, that would be rebellion. And that would be a heart that's not fitted for heaven, and we want to go. Now, what about this thing? Some people receive it in there or on there, in their forehead, and some in their hand. The forehead represents the mind. Right behind your forehead is your frontal lobe. That's where your decisions are made. And those who receive the mark of the beast in their forehead have agreed, they've decided, this is right, we're going to go along with it. But then there'll be others who won't believe it's right. But they'll do it anyway, maybe under duress. They'll acquiesce and will do it even though they maybe don't believe it's right. Your hand is a symbol of actions. Whatever your hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Forehead, belief. Hand, acquiescence. Cooperation. Going with the flow. Now, some people are going to be enthusiastic about the mark of the beast, and they are. Some will think it's the best thing since sliced bread, and it will be portrayed as such, as a panacea for the problems confronting planet Earth. We are plowing headlong into major problems. But as we think about the mark of the beast, you remember, if you don't have it, you won't be able to buy and sell. I'm going to take a few moments to repeat something that I've already shared, but I'm hopeful that repetition will deepen impression. Some will say with some enthusiasm that the mark of the beast has something to do with a silicon chip or a card of some kind. Think about what the world is going through right now. Uh, we honestly do not know what mechanism is going to govern or control the buying and selling down at the end of time. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. If you go back, if you go back to wartime and rationing, you didn't need any chip. Buying and selling was, was throttled. Uh, if you go back to Eastern Europe, there were no computers anywhere, but everybody knew who was in the Communist Party and who was not. And if you weren't, you were on the outer. You, you suffered in many cases. No computers. Buying and selling were regulated. Privileges were withheld or granted. No computers. So the mark of the beast isn't dependent on computers, computer chips, or any other thing. No doubt, if you have technology involved, it would make controlling buying and selling very simple. But there are already computers involved your bank manager if she wished to do so or if he wished to do so could make life very complicated for you with the click of one mouse right there at his or her desk easy so the future has arrived how in the world will people be prevented from buying and selling don't know doesn't matter but as i explained let's keep two things in mind one is the mark of the beast the other issue is preventing people from buying and selling. This is merely a coercive measure. Whatever that mechanism to keep people from buying and selling, it's not the mark of the beast. You don't have to worry about chips and credit cards and debit cards, and you don't have to worry about any of that. I'm not suggesting it's all good, but none of that is inherently evil, and none of that is the mark of the beast. It's merely a mechanism designed to move you you know there'll be some who will say, I do not want to do this. Well, if you don't, then you won't be able to buy and sell. I run a risk saying this because you may think I'm being subversive, and I'm not. But we find that today with mandates about vaccines. If you get it, you'll be able to travel. You'll be able to attend events in some parts of the world. If you don't, you won't. It's a similar principle. I'm not saying it's an evil thing. I'm merely drawing a comparison between one and the other. Frequently, there will be consequences for your actions. If you don't do that, then you won't be able to do this. If you don't receive the mark of the beast, then you won't be able to buy and sell. Uh, people will be motivated when they cannot pay their rent or purchase food. 
Recent developments in this world show us there'll be no difficulty in forcing a decree like that. Well, what will bring this about? Keep something in mind. It says that he causes all that dwell upon the earth to worship the beast. So there are going to be laws. This observance of a false Sabbath day will be enforced by law based on what we see in God's word. What would bring that about? We can't know exactly, but we do know that in a time of real crisis, society reacts. In the end of time, we'll have a real crisis. Daniel spoke about a time of trouble coming such as never was since there was a nation. You can imagine in a time of crisis, the world saying, let's come together. You can imagine people saying, let's give the environment time to rest. You can imagine people saying, let's give people time for family. These are good things. But when religious rights are encroached upon, remember this nation was, 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 was conceived upon the idea that we have certain unalienable rights It seems one day that that principle will be repudiated. When worship is regulated, mandated, enforced, when consciences are forced, when you are compelled to violate the law of God, it is then that this becomes the mark of the beast. People will promote it as a good thing. Society is in trouble. Let's take time out. The planet is going down the drain. Let's back off just a little bit. Let's have a day, observe a day. Maybe we, can, maybe we can find dead center if we do that. Perhaps we can promote healing and wholeness among society if we do this. But what happens is you have a law of man elevated and the law of God relegated. That's when the disciple of Jesus will, be, will have to say, that's just too much. I cannot go there. That's against the will of God. I cannot violate my conscience. I must honor God. I need to tell you this. Even though that we know that one day, Sunday, becomes the mark of the beast, it is not the mark of the beast now. It doesn't make it right, but it is not the mark of the beast. Nobody has the mark of the beast today, not a single person. But today, the groundwork is being laid. Some future time, this will be enforced. Satan has succeeded in leading almost the entire world away from fidelity to God. We are already at that point when only few legitimately can claim to follow the Bible as their rule of faith and practice. Satan's crowning achievement will be to lead people away from faithfulness to the law of God. Instead, the world accepts a replacement to God's law. And that will be no different than when Israel rejected God and began to worship Baal. Therefore, it's important that we make a decision to stand upon the word of God. You know, I know what it's like to be challenged in your thinking. I know that. Uh, I knew nothing about the Sabbath as a child. I attended church every Sunday, felt very proud of that. I mean that appropriately. Loved my church, never decided to move away. And one day, God challenged me. It happened, it happened over time. But God brought to my attention that I was not living in harmony with the word of God. What would I do? Would I tell God, I know better than you? Would I say to God, I see that I'm wrong, but I don't like that? Would I say to God, I would rather stand with the crowd than shoulder the cross? Would I do that? It didn't make me a better Christian than anyone else to follow what I saw as the leading of God. I, 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 I had to. How do you not surrender to God when you read in the Bible the will of God? Recently, this is in the last year, maybe two years, a television news reporter in Florida was contacted by a viewer. The viewer sent an email, went right to her at the television station. The email said something like, I was watching you on TV. I see you from time to time on the news, and I notice you've got a little lump on your neck. I had a lump on my neck just like that. Got it checked out. It was thyroid cancer. I suggest that you get that checked out too. The woman read that, and she said, what in the world? 
Who does this woman think? Why in the world would I? I don't mean to suggest that she was belligerent about it, but she wasn't accepting of it. But she did tell her boyfriend. And the boyfriend said, yeah, you got a little lump there. Why don't you get it checked out? Oh, there's no need. Why don't you just go and see the doctor? But why would I bother? Just see. And if it's nothing, you got nothing to worry about. And if it's something, maybe this is the best thing you've ever done. So finally, she went to the doctor. The doctor did an examination and discovered she had thyroid cancer. Spread to her lymph nodes. She underwent a course of treatment. It was successful, thank God. She's back on her feet. She's back on air. She's doing great. But it wasn't comfortable for her when somebody pointed out, there might be something wrong with you. Who wants that, right? God is gracious enough to point out to us, there might be something about your experience that's not quite complete. God says, I want you to grow higher. I want you to go deeper. I want you to come further with me. I want you to to grow into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He takes a little risk. You suggest to somebody that maybe there's something new that they could learn, take on board in their experience. My, what if they're offended by that? What if they don't like hearing about that from you? God loves us enough to tell us anyway. That's part of the reason why you are at Revelation today, the Great Reset, because God had something to share with you that you might never have known, or maybe you'd heard of, maybe you'd discounted, maybe you'd rejected, maybe you just weren't sure about. But now I think you're a whole lot more sure than you were. And God invites us to go to the spiritual doctor and allow the Holy Spirit to do that work in our lives that needs to be done. It's vital that when we have the opportunity to do so, we just stand for God. We stand up, stand up for Jesus. We say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. We want to value the cross of Christ today. And if we do, we'll value it then. We want to come to know Jesus as our friend now. And then when the time of crisis comes, Jesus will be our friend then. We want to be serious about the word of God now so we can be serious then. We want to have our eyes on Jesus now so that come what may, we will keep our eyes on Jesus then. I want to say something I don't need to say. I've said it already, but I'm not judging the veracity or the validity of someone's experience, whether they agree with me or not. What you do with something may not necessarily be, oh, let me put it this way. What you do with something I say is not what decides the validity of your Christian experience, but it's what you do with something you know God is saying. So if I can share with you something in behalf of God and you can say, yeah, that's God speaking to me through that man. Now you've got a decision to make. I'm not judging you, not judging your past. This isn't a judgment call on your family or your church. We are just looking at the Bible. And we are deciding that in earth's last days, we, by the grace of God, want to be faithful to God. And we want Jesus in our hearts, living his best life in our life. So we can receive of his blessing, lay ourselves down to sleep at night, knowing God has my heart, Jesus is with me. And Christ said in John 4 and verse 24, that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. By the way, every so often somebody says, well, I follow the impressions of the Spirit when I sense God speaking in my heart. And I have to say this, if you can read this book, then God is speaking to your heart. It's just that simple. The Word of God says that the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He roars and brings trouble. He roars and promotes fear. He roars and causes unsettledness. He roars and he brings division. But I want to tell you something about the devil. Well, no, I'll tell you something about Jesus. 1 John 4 verse 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So let the lion roar. But remember that Jesus is also a lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah. He is undefeated. Satan has been soundly defeated. That's your answer in temptation. God is greater. It's your answer in trial. God is greater. It's your answer to sin. God is greater. 
It's your answer in the midst of difficult moments. God is greater. A vast company of unnumbered millions might come against you, but you can remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God is greater. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in a fiery furnace. Christ was greater. Daniel was in a lion's den. Christ was greater. They took Paul out of town, stoned him with stones, and left him for dead. Somehow he got up, and that's because greater is he that was in Paul than he that was in the world. There was Peter in a jail. They had just killed James. They were going to kill Peter too. But greater is he that was in Peter than he that was in the world. An angel came, wake up, let's go. Prison doors opened up before him. And before long, he was outside. He went to the house, banged on the door. Rhoda came out. Who is it? He said, it's Peter. She left him there, ran in the house. It's Peter. They said, you're out of your mind. They'd been praying for Peter. I guess they didn't believe that God would answer their prayers. He was right at their front doorstep. They said, cannot be him. I'll tell you what, it was him. And you know why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God is great. Jesus is your hope. Christ is your righteousness. You may hide under the shadow of his wings. How great is your God? There was a man in Australia who was put in prison, broke out. He was originally from Yugoslavia when Yugoslavia was a country. And he was worried that they would deport him back to Yugoslavia. This was right around 1990, 1991. Communism was falling, but it hadn't fallen yet. And Yugoslavia was still a nation. He said, they'll send me home. I don't want that. So he broke out. He laid low. He did odd jobs. He lived in undesirable places. He didn't move freely. He didn't share his actual identity. 30 years later, he went to the police and he turned himself in. He said, it's me. I broke out of jail 30 years ago. Here's why. He'd been sleeping in the sand dunes of Sydney's northern beaches, New South Wales, Australia doing odd jobs just to survive. But the guilt and the grind and the difficulty, he said, I might as well just turn myself in. No guarantee. One thing's for sure, they won't send him back to Yugoslavia because there's no Yugoslavia anymore. I doubt they want to deport the man. He doesn't know what was going to happen. He did not know what would happen to him when he turned himself in. And I'm not sure that has yet been decided for this happened only recently. Can you imagine being on the run for three decades, 30 long years, avoiding arrest, evading the authorities, living a lie, guilt gripping you, can't get it off you. It's like slime clinging to you for 30 long years until finally he said, I surrender. That said, I'm done. I can't live this way a moment longer. He turned himself in, surrendered to the authorities. You know, there are people in this room tonight just like that, running from Jesus when you ought to be running to Jesus. There are people watching from afar. You're on the run, and you're running in the wrong direction. Now, the good thing about Jesus is that as you run away from him, he follows you. He appeals to you. It's Jesus speaking in your ear. You think you're going to... Get in the boat like Jonah did and sail far from Nineveh. Christ was there with him. You cannot outrun the spirit of almighty God. And that discomfort that you experience when you step into sin, when you ignore God, when you read the Bible and say, I'm not doing that. That discomfort, that's God speaking to you. And God is saying, I can take all of that away if you would just surrender to me now. Just surrender and you can have peace. I I, I met a fellow in prison. Ultimately, I said to somebody, what's he doing here? Oh yeah, he shouldn't be here. He was accused of murder. He protested his innocence, looked like he was going to get off. And then he said, no, stop. I did it. He confessed to a murder that he was going to get away with. And they put him in jail for, I don't know, was something like 10 years or more. And he saw out his 10 years and they released him from jail. And he walked out of there with a light heart and a clear conscience. 
All of us are criminals inasmuch as we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you turn yourself in, fall on the mercy of God, trust in the forgiveness and the grace of God, then you can look forward not just to life in this world, but life in the world to come. Jesus is coming back soon. It won't be long and he will be here. And when he comes for you, I'm wondering, what's going to happen in your experience? William Shatner, the 90-year-old actor, just went into space. Well, he was above the ground for 10 minutes, had a few moments of weightlessness, said it was the greatest thing that ever happened to him, came back down to the ground, flew up there in a rich man's toy. I mean, I guess there's part of me that thinks it's got to be cool to have your own spaceship. But that would be a very small part of me. I'd like to take William Shatner by the hand and say, follow me. I don't know where he is with God, and I'm not talking about his experience. I'd love to sit down and say, how exciting was that, Bill? It was great, John. It was great. I would explain to him, you can have more of that. Because when Jesus comes back, you're going to experience weightlessness. Gravity won't hold you on this ground. Did you read the story about these guys flying into space, looking down at the earth? Did you read it with any envy at all? I don't know. Maybe you did. I think most of us would look at that and say, on the one hand, a little extravagant. On the other hand, a little cool. But nothing compared to what God has for you. Nothing at all. Jesus will come back soon and we go up. We leave this world behind. You know, by the way, this world's pretty cool. There's a lot in this world to like, a lot to love. But it's not a shadow of what it ought to be. And it doesn't hold a candle to what God has for you in heaven and then in the earth when the earth is made new. Would you say yes to God tonight? Would you say, sign me up, God, for that great space flight, not just 10 minutes, but an eternity of traveling around this great universe, reveling in the creation of God. You will be exhibit A of what the grace of God can do in a life, redeemed from this world of sin, not because of your goodness, but because you trusted in Jesus and you were led by his spirit. Send me a text message. Oh, I didn't bring my phone out. I, I promise I'll text you right back. The number is 71392. That's the number that you'll text. Text me the word STAND, S-T-A-N-D, STAND. And when you do, the moment you do, I'll send you back a link. Click on that link. Let's read through it. Point number one. I choose to follow the teachings of Jesus as found in the Bible. Point two, I choose not to worship the beast or receive the mark of the beast. I choose to worship him that made heaven and earth by keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Number four, it is my desire to be baptized or rebaptized. And why would you wait? Number five, questions to discuss. Please fill your details out clearly, legibly. We want to pray for you. Just send me a text message. My number is 71392. And as you do, I'll send you a link. I'll come right back to you. 71392, text the word STAND. And right away, I'll text you right back. You'll see a link. Click on that link and you too can fill out a card. My prayer is that you will make a decision for Jesus and surrender your heart to him. I'd like to pray for you now. Can we pray together? Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we ask that there be nothing between our soul, our spiritual life, and Jesus, our Savior. We've had an opportunity to make a decision for you tonight. I'm encouraged with those who've been deciding night by night, decision by decision, Lord, take my life, encourage us all to that end. And of course, I would pray for that one, should there be one who hesitated on the banks of the Jordan and did not cross over, Please speak to that heart and draw that one to you. We thank you, Lord, for being so good, so gracious, so, so very, very good to us. Keep us, please, we pray. We want to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes back. Let that be so. Write your law in our heart. Guide us by your spirit. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen.